Uh, uh, Dr. Manessa, I see your lips moving, but uh, you're muted. Uh, moderator? I, I'm okay. I just muted, but I'm okay. I'm online. Okay, great. All thank good, you. I think. I think you can hear me clearly. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use my uh... <clears throat> moderator. If you appear moderator, hello. Hello. We are waiting for the moderator to come into the room. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah. I, I, this is a, this is a question I had. We are supposed to start at seven forty-five. Yes. Right. Yes. We're, yes. But so we're all here and everything gathered. Do you cue me? Cue us in as to when they, they open or when we go live. Um, I will. I'll cue in to let you know when we we go live. Okay then. Thank you. Number one, be a lima printing and bonum to me and say. Yeah, okay. It's going to cheers. I'm going to cheers. I'm going to cheers. Everybody's looking forward. They really invited a lot of people. <laughs> yes. SG, thank you very much for introducing also the whole concept of global digital uh, compact. Which is going to be next year, is it? I believe so, but I I took it from your notes because it is very um very relevant, very you know uh yeah. keeping with what we want to do as an organization. Exactly. So I I think it is a great place to start the discussion. Yep, and actually I think the UN Secretary General is expecting to get a lot of comments from various organizations. So this also will be um, an input to the to the global digital compact next year because they say that when look I was reading the documents at the end is inviting various organizations and stakeholders to to put some of the practical measures that will be used. So I was like, wow, this is the right <laughs> it, it was the right because also the one of the key issues is connecting all people to the internet and safeguarding human rights. Oh wow.
Good morning from the diplomatic city of um, Addis Ababa in Africa. Uh, my name is Caleb Ogunlele, and I'm happy to welcome you all to this session on Commonwealth Ad Talk for Action. Um, can you hold the Amy Somebody needs to mute. I'm not. Yes. Shall we start? Okay, great. Uh, so um, the organizers of this event is the Commonwealth. I think, Madam, we can start as you wait for Pakistan to join in. The, the moderator is speaking. <laughs> oh, so, uh, oh he's just... speaking to the people in the room, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not just speaking to the people. Uh, I'm also communicating to everyone online as well. So yeah. um, it's organized by the Commonwealth Telecommunication organization so we want to welcome you this morning and thank you for joining uh, so over to you um like that okay i'm not hearing anything further good morning ladies and gentlemen yeah, for my name is going for us um, we can hear you madam so the reset password leonard it shouldn't it work if i do i'm I think the moderator said we can start. Moderator. Yes, please go ahead. Right. We Thank started. you very much to our moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bernadette Lewis, and I am the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, the oldest and largest Commonwealth institution dedicated to communications. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our second Hard Talk for Action open forum session at the Global Internet Governance Forum in Ethiopia. Today, we will be addressing the subject, connecting all people and safeguarding human rights. And the challenge is how do we ensure that every person, wherever they may be in the world, can connect to the internet, are able to make effective use of its features and services, and at the same time, enjoy their human rights. This morning, we are privileged to have three distinguished guests. Mr. Amja, uh, um, Ajmal Awan, He's the Chief of International Cooperation of the Ministry of Information, Technology and Telecommunications of the Federal Government of Pakistan. He is an accomplished change management agent who has built partnerships in the public and private sector over five continents and has led cloud and telecommunication businesses with global technology vendors and service providers. Also, we are pleased to have Mr. Lassina Kone. He's the Director General of the um, Smart Africa, and he's a former advisor to the Prime Minister and the President of the Republic of, of Côte d'Ivoire in the area of public reform and digital transformation. And our last panelist is Dr. Rosa Percent, a lifelong academic. She's an anthropologist and a senior lecturer in contemporary social issues at the University of Namibia. And these three panelists are going to be pre presenting their perspectives on different aspects of the subject. And finally, I'm introducing our provocateur, Dr. Emmanuel Manessa. He's the director for industry affairs for the Tanzanian uh, communication regulatory authority and he has more than 15 years of experience in the telecommunication sector and dr manessa as our provocateur he is responsible for cutting through the talk and the words and the excuses for not attaining meaningful affordable universal broadband connectivity for not ensuring that our citizens can make effective use of the technology and not protecting human rights in an increasingly digital world. So at the end of this session, we will have dispensed with the things that are really not uh, effective, and we will have 
actionable solutions for these challenges. So without further hesitation, I present our provocateur, Dr. Manessa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General of Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, for all the effort you made in making this session today a reality. Also, special thanks to the administration of Ethiopia for hosting the IGF 2022. Without taking much time, our panel discussion today is focused on connecting all people to the internet and safeguarding human rights. We all know with the advancement of technology come evolution of needs. Today, access to internet is widely recognized as an indispensable enabler of broad range of human rights. Safeguarding become the essential key to human rights protection. How to protect human rights in a hyper-connected world. The need for political will to achieve meaningful access to the internet as well as technologies for connectivities and the implication to the energy cannot be taken lightly. So the panel is going to discuss this, but the discussion also is well aligned with the Global Digital Compact. The Global Digital Compact is expected to outline shared principles of an open, free, secure digital future for all, which may include, among others, issues related to connecting all people to the internet and safeguarding human rights. The need, as I said, for political will to achieve meaningful access to the internet is critical. Now, I invite Mr. Ajma Anwar so that he could explain and demonstrate about, to share the experience how Pakistan is demonstrating the political will to connect all the citizens to the internet. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction. And um, I, I really appreciate, um, and, and apologies, uh, there was a bit of a delay. So why there are two videos, uh, Melissa? There, there are two videos, so we need to just, uh, no, no, there are two videos. It's why okay, but we can hear you, you can proceed. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks again. Uh, the, um, first of all, uh, apologies from our uh, federal uh, minister, uh, Mr. Amin al uh, He couldn't join in person uh, because of the prior engagements. And uh, he authorized me to uh, represent the ministry and uh, his uh, government um, for this um, auspicious um, you know, moment and uh, the, the the, the event uh, you're, organ you're organizing here. Now, the, um, the government, uh, this government has spent a lot of money uh, and there's a political will to um, grow the revenue in the ICT sector, but also to have the connectivity in the country in all the remote areas and also um, growing the ecosystem in the ICT sector. So not only having the fiber connectivity or the dark fiber, but on top of that, having the applications um, like the, you know, applications for e-commerce, um, having uh, the programs for women empowerment, having programs for, um, uh, you know, for startups. Uh, so a lot of activities are happening. So the, the vision of the government was the digital Pakistan vision. And uh, the underpinning that vision, uh, there are five uh, pillars. So connectivity was on top of that. And then uh, the second pillar was uh, the um, uh, e-governance, uh, then infrastructure, uh, digital scaling, uh, and the startup ecosystem. Um, you can gauge the political uh, will uh, from the fact uh, that uh, the revenue in the ICT sector has grown um, uh, about 40 times uh, in the last three years. Um, in fact, if I calculate the, the entire government span, this government span, uh, it will be close to the 70 percent growth in the ICT revenue. So a lot of um, uh, you know targets set for the coming years. Uh, and I can uh, answer your questions if you have anything 
uh, else to ask, but connectivity and the meaning, meaningful connectivity is on the top of agenda for this government. Um, now, if I give, give you an example, um, about um, 50 billion rupees, Pakistan rupees, have been spent since uh, this government uh, took over. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, well, since I would say this minister took over, uh, Mr. Amin al Haq, uh, and his party, and that was uh, from 2018. So 50 billion. And uh, in total, how much was spent uh, on the connectivity, particularly under the uh, what we call the USF, the organization that was set up in particular for, for serving the unserved and underserved areas in the country. Uh, and that is a USF Universal Service Fund that was established in 2006, 2007. Uh, until today, uh, they spent 89 billion rupees. Um, but for this government, uh, or since our minister took over, uh, they have spent about 50 billion alone in the last four years. So that is the will you can see having the connectivity. And the minister usually uh, uses the word, calls it meaningful connectivity. Um, so this connectivity we are talking about, it's on, on top of what the um, operators are working on. So our telecom operators, like in tier one, tier two, uh, the telecom operators will be uh, spending their own money from the private sector, and they will be connecting the main cities or tier one cities where they see a business case. Uh, so about 160,000 kilometers of fiber was uh, connected uh, in the country. Um, now, the areas where there is uh, there's no a strong business case for these operators, like that the four mobile operators we, we have here, uh, and uh, all of them are big groups, like the Beyond Group, a company called Jazz, Telenor Group as Telenor Pakistan. Uh, another operator is um, Uphone, which is under the umbrella of uh, the management is under uh, Ithisalat, Emirates Telecom. And then China Mobile, Zong. So they are already working a lot connecting the major cities, but our government and uh, the Ministry of Information Technology had set up Universal Service Fund to connect those areas where mobile operators uh, do not connect uh, or they don't, it doesn't make uh, enough uh, business case or business sense to them. So the unserved and underserved areas. So the USF is uh, the institution under this ministry other governments and other uh, or countries have similar setup of USF in Asia Pacific, but we have seen the reports from GSMA and we have seen the reports from a lot of other analysts that the Pakistan's USF Universal Service Fund is one of the best performing uh, USF fund um, that is uh, performing in the Asia Pacific on top of all. And uh, until last year, I found out that there were some there were some funds which were unspent, but uh, then the uh, uh, under the direction of the uh, federal minister, Mr. Sayyid Amin al-Haq, His Excellency, and the CEO of USF uh, did a fantastic job, and they took the money out of the finance department, the one that was previously held there, not spent. They are now going to 100% utilization of the funds in making sure that the amount is well spent for connecting the unconnected, the remote areas. And one more piece of information, before this government uh, took uh, the, uh, or our minister came on board, uh, the connectivity was close to um, uh, about, well, I would say before, sorry, not this government, I would say even when the USF was set up in 2006 and 2007, uh, before having the USF, the connectivity was about 44% uh, in the country. Uh, and after the USF took over, like the, this new uh, institution was established in 2006, 2007, 75% uh, of the uh, reach has been increased. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge number. Um, yeah. And when this, came, this government came on board, I already mentioned, and our minister spent uh, about 50 billion 
rupees uh, within the last four years, which is uh, more than the money that was spent between 2006-7 to uh, 2018. Uh, that was about, I would say, about 30 billion rupees that was spent during um, uh, that time, like around 10, 11 years. But in the four Thank years, you. Uh, money spent so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for demonstrating a really practical experience. And I can see that the political will is there and you are walking the talk because we see the government has considered broadband as a public utility and invested on that. Uh, I really appreciate the experience and I could see Digital Pakistan vision is realized because of the political and the government uh, uh, will to invest on that. I uh, will come back to you later to talk about how do you bridge the gap? Because I can see uh, one of the challenge is the gap from coverage gap to adoption gap. But I will come back to you during the discussion. For now, uh, I would, li I would like to ask Mr. Lassina Kony to talk about technologies for connectivity and the implication for energy. And I'm asking you this because, you know, uh, some years ago, the issue of energy in our village, you see the electric grid is passing through on top, but the village is totally dark. They don't have connectivity. And later, you see some strategies, they came with it that uh, started to connect electricity and energy to the villages to have access. Now, we'll, I would like also to hear from uh, Lassina Kone about the technologies for connectivity and the implications for energy. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Emmanuel. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, and talk about this uh, subject. Uh, before I actually start, it, I think uh, on, on the overall, I think the main really point here, we need to understand that uh, what happened to the telecom sector, it has to happen on the energy sector. Yep. By, I'm talking mainly about liberalization. Mm -hmm. If you all remember uh, back in the beginning and mainly in Africa, I can say or in general everywhere around the world, but mainly in Africa, uh, most of the telecom company used to belong to the government. Yeah. We used to see Uganda Telecom, Tanzania Telecom. It was a state-owned company. And the liberalization came, we started sometime around uh, uh, 19, uh, late 1990s, uh, some of them even earlier than that. And when the liberalization started and you know, uh, private sector start coming in, and now we have the mobile network operator, they're doing also fixed. That actually helped many country to to jump into the mobile technology uh, and instead of having a fixed phone. You see, the fixed phone line in uh, many cities and the many villages is starting dropping because people start mm -hmm. leapfrogging from the mobile technology because the liberalization came, and we see these examples, in uh, countries like Malaysia and so on and so forth. Some of our African countries, they did not go through a traditional development path or the convention that we call. Today, we are half billion mobile subscriber or clocks, more than a half billion mobile subscriber in Africa. What has caused that? It is because of the liberalizations of the telecom sector. Okay. Again, today, when we talk, about the uh, 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 the digital economy. Mm -hmm. The developing country, we can leverage infrastructure and technological innovations to bridge the digital divide. That's what happened in the telecom sector. Mm -hmm. If we talk about uh, the adoptions of the technology in our countries, if we want to leverage and capitalize on the success of the liberalization of the telecom sector, the energy has to go through the same. Because when we talk about access to energy, the fundamental thing we need to have access to energy. If the energy sector is going through uh, a struggle, the why I'm saying a struggle, because as you know, most of the, our countries in Africa, here I'm talking specifically about Africa, the energy country still belongs. It's a state, state it's still government owned and state owned. It's not a private sector owned. Mm -hmm. That is the first fundamental thing that we need to do. Mm -hmm. 
Two, we need to diversify the sources of the energy. Okay. If I say sources of energy, Africa is where the sun is. Okay. So generating electricity, source of the energy, of course, we do have hydraulic power, uh, we have wind power, and we do have a, a solar power uh, where the solar the energy is being generated based on the private sector or of course some of the big giant private sector and sold to the government to be able to pump <laughs> into the grid. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say today the situations in Africa, the, 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 the progress we made in the telecom sector, we have not seen that happening in the energy sector. And it becomes it's really worrisome because we we when we look at our continent today with only uh, penetration rate in terms of uh, into people who have internet access uh, in, in in africa it's about 30, 39 to 40 percent while the average around the world is about 63 uh, percent i believe the new report of the itu shows that the 2.9 2.7 billion people still remain out of 8 billion still remain without uh, uh unconnected but africa is still around 40 percent so unless we take just some of these necessary steps, I do not believe that you know it will be will be able to actually meet the SDG goal by 2030, and that that's really hard to talk about that. Okay. Thank you very much, and you have touched the issue of liberalization in energy, diversification, clean energy, and also uh, the issue of adoption. Now. Uh, the fact that many people do not adopt broadband mobile, even when it is available, and thus underscore the closing of the digital divide, is not simply the matter of extending network coverage. So uh, you see that police maker wishing to, for their people to realize the benefits of internet connectivity must understand other potential barriers to adoption, which you have mentioned it. So I'll come back to you later to discuss the issues related to affordable universal communication access options that we have and also further on the issue of adoption but now i would like to go to uh, dr rosa we uh, to give us experience and to discuss the issue of human rights in the internet how do we safeguard human rights as we bring everybody online and we know that both offline and online should be protected welcome thank you very much and thank you very much for this opportunity i regard this conversation and discussion as a very serious and uh, important discussion taking us forward and I would like to thank everyone for bringing me on board, especially the SG, and uh, thank you for the communication so far. I would like to start this conversation just to say in general that 2020 came with the COVID and that really had a huge impact on our, what we are discussing this morning. I just want to throw that in ahead of this entire discussion to say how important the protection of human rights are. And I would like to go to say there is a general consensus that the access to information is indispensable for a functional democracy in general. It is for this reason that access to information has been recognized and guaranteed as a fundamental human right in various regional, international, and, and national instruments. Mm -hmm. However, the impact of information communication technologies, as well as other new technologies in this new and environment, in, environment of freedoms has actually asked that a, a, a new type of a, a generation of un, human rights need to be discussed. As we know, human rights has been around mm -hmm. because, on the other hand, 
day by day, the consumption and the use of this unstoppable form of technology without control is realizing grave violations of human rights in all aspects of life in in regards to the use of these electronic devices those of which have direct relation with liberty integrity formation indemnity and intangible uh, uh, affecting especially our young people and how do we bring it about my concern today and discussion with regards to human rights will definitely be how do we protect and, and, and guarantee this new form of uh, technology not to infringe on any person being young or old being connected to an institutional uh be infringed and damaged i thank you thank you very much uh dr rosa and maybe i can ask you to add more the u.n national assembly declared access to the internet a basic right integral allowing individuals to exercise their rights to freedom of opinion and expression emphasizing access to facilitate vast opportunity for affordable and inclusive education Additionally, the UN also stressed the importance of empowering empowerment of all women and girls by enhancing their access to information and communication technology. Uh, can you say something about empowering these dimensioned group and what needs to be done to empower the said groups? I think the empowerment in terms of gender is very important. As you have alluded uh, to your statement that you just made, women, especially women and young girls, are still not there where we are supposed to be. Now this new technologies and new things, is it hampering us further or bringing us uh, back into the sphere? And I would dearly want to say the fact that it was a statement that you just made, bring us to the forefront to really come in and, 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 and take part in all of these activities that are, are, are going on and not to take any child, any female back to where we are with the new uh, technologies and information and taking us forward and give us, giving, allowing and giving us that space. But again, it's how we use the space, how we utilize the space, how it mustn't take us back but taking us forward on this new road. Thank you very much for that uh, elaboration. Uh, back to Ajma. Uh, you mentioned about the investment that was done in Pakistan, which we really appreciate and is a very great job. Uh, it has been mentioned that connectivity alone is not enough to drive uh, wider broadband adoption. Availability of broadband does not equal adoption. Adoption of broadband is equally important to ensure the benefit that goes along with internet use to everyone. That's why we're hearing connecting the unconnected, connecting all people. You talked about meaningful connectivity, which we really uh, appreciate, uh, and is a very good step. So while broadband may be available, broadband adoption refers to the extent to which citizens subscribe and use broadband. What should be done to increase broadband adoption? Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, that's really great to um, have that vision and that understanding because to connect, it, the, the, the analogy is like you build roads to connect a village, but there are no cars to drive on those roads. And what is the point? Very good. So yeah. we provide <laughs> so we provide connectivity uh, to the villages and remote areas, but then there is no utilization, then what is the point? So it's so, so a great question. Um, now, 
that so the government has really thought through and they build those programs where not only they provide connectivity even but have the utilization in terms of the applications in terms of social um activities for women um for youth um for person with disability uh, persons with disabilities so uh, the government uh, not only uh, came up with the plans but they usually uh, there are different events awareness programs also for mm -hmm. uh, for for women so there were computer labs set up in the country 13 computer labs were set up under the USF the universal mm -hmm. service fund which i mentioned so that the girls in the remote areas in the unserved and underserved areas in particular can learn computer skills uh the government also started something called a digi skills so if you go to the website digi skills.pk and you will see lots of courses are developed and they are by the government and that is uh for people for youth for women for 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 um um you know young girls and uh, even adults they can use the skills using this connectivity remotely they can connect there was also a program for persons with disabilities so that wow. we can ma mainstream uh, the person with disabilities and imp uh, hearing impairment and visual impairment they can use the connectivity and uh, use the computers and use the uh, different websites and and the marketing skills and entrepreneurship uh, development also uh, the government started a project uh, with the support from ITU International Telecommunication Union a program was started uh, called the Smart Village project and uh, under the Smart Village projects we are doing initially um, uh, connectivity uh, and um, you know making uh, five uh, villages a uh, smart villages so what we'll do is not only we connect uh, the village but on top of that we connect the school the basic health units uh, we are talking to food and agriculture organization to have the agriculture information the you know law and order um, organizations they they can be connected because what happens in the remote areas people can't drive sometimes or they don't have uh, that much uh, of uh, facilities in terms of having cars of their own or sometimes the public transport is not good but to provide them the facilities what you do is on top of the connectivity you provide facilities at their homes at their doorsteps and that is they can learn um you know the e-commerce skills they can use facebook marketing and, and that is what we do that is what we do is part of the itu programs uh, we every year we go for the girls in ict program and we then start a number of trainings and we are going to do uh, in the next 10 days by the way un officials will come to pakistan so we are again celebrating girls in ict program there will be training programs again there will be person with disabilities program and we are also working a child online protection program one step more so not only the connectivity consumption but also we have thought through the government has thought through how to protect our kids from cyber bullying harassment identity theft and not only utilize the broadband but also um you know reduce the negative impacts of the broadband and make it affordable available and meaningful for all the community members regardless of age ethnicity and regardless of uh you know which background they they come from but there's more focus on our uh, underserved and uh, unserved areas the reason being in pakistan and um in, in some other uh, developing countries as you know a lot of people they live uh in the rural areas and the same is the case in pakistan more than 62% live in the rural areas so there's more and more focus on the women empowerment uh and youth development for those areas in particular thank you thank you very much for this intuitive uh uh information regarding the what is done and i'll come back to you on the issue of digital skills i can see that you're working through the pillars that you just mentioned of uh, digital Pakistan vision. And I'm really impressed by two things that will need further clarification, the issue of affordability and digital skills that you have uh, 
mentioned. But let me go to uh, Mr. Kone, the Director, Kone, Director General. You mentioned that majority of people in developing countries rely heavily on smartphones as the only access to the internet. And this is true. It doesn't mean that we don't need to have computer and the other things, but what you said is true. Now, uh, that most of these developing countries, especially uh, in Africa, you see smartphone the only way that uh, people get access to the internet. So what strategy can be used to increase penetration of smartphones and other smart devices? Thank you. I think I hope I'm not uh, muted. Yes, uh, thank you very much for these questions. In fact, I, I, I listened to the, the progress made in Pakistan. It's quite impressive. In fact, Pakistan is well known uh, mm -hmm. for the optimal use of the universal access funds. Mm -hmm. That, of course, uh, we are having some challenges with it, of course, in most of the African country because uh, a proper management of universal access funds uh, is able to increase the broadband penetrations in the rural area, as the Pakistan's really saying. Now, what can we do? Let's be very clear in what I'm going to say in the next uh, few few minutes. Mm -hmm. Increasing the internet connectivity in any given country, it is not a magic. Yep. Because <clears throat> today, what we have today in terms of supply of the satellite capacity around the planet if you combine that with the supply of the fiber optic or fiber submarine cable around our continent and around the world, you combine it together with the uh, what we call the uh, fiber cable in the cities and the villages. When you combine all this supply together, it covers 96% of the world population. Mm -hmm. So why the planet itself is only at about 62 to 63% connected according to the recent report by the ITU. If you look at that average, it translated into close to 40% uh, or 41, 42% in Africa. It has to do with the regulations. It does not have to do with the access to funds. Because the private sector is out there to do the right investments if the right regulatory environment is conducive in those countries <clears throat> to make those countries attractive for the investor like MNO, which are the telecom operator to come and cover <clears throat> areas, which are the coverage area. And talking about the coverage gap, <clears throat> coverage gap, which means the area that are not covered by the telecom infrastructure. According to the, to the World Bank statistics, Africa need from now to 2030 about 103 billion US dollars to close the financing gap for the financing gap for the connectivity. But be careful, don't make a mistake. If we have today about 40% people connected, we have something called also a usage gap. What does that actually mean? It represents on the continent about another 30%, on the overall continent, 30%. It means connectivity is available, but it is not being used for four reasons. One, affordability. Two, content. It means give our mothers and our sisters a reason to use the internet, not just for social media. Three, access to smart devices you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. No matter what we do, as long as an average price of a smart device is either it's the smartphone or it's the computer, as long as it's below certain median, the median revenue per hour population, it will not take up. And number four, it's the security. It's basically a confidence uh, of the population of using the technology without being scared of that I relate sometimes to the type of security. So if these four conditions are not met, we are still missing about 30%. Potentially, if we are able to work on this affordability, access to devices, affordability, access to devices, 
uh, the context and the local context, as well as the cybersecurity, we have an opportunity from now to 20, 2025 to get about 30% more connected people, which will bring Africa to about 70% or 75% by 2025. Thank you very much. And you should remember that most of the policymakers are logging in and they're hearing what you're saying. So we really appreciate it. Well, well this, is a, this, this is the hard Feed talk. for purpose regulatory framework. Yes. Feed for the, purpose the, regulatory framework. You mentioned the, affordability, yes. local content, access yes. to smartphone security. Could you please explain yes. more? How do we achieve affordability? What policy or what should be done from the regulatory framework to to drive affordability of the services. Okay. This is a hard this is a hard talk. Yep. Okay. <laughs> the internet grows in Africa the past seven years, precisely between 2015 and 2019, is the compounded annual growth rate of 45%. Yep. Why the internet is still the most expensive on our continent in Africa? There's no magic bullet. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say, if the decision makers are listening, mm -hmm. the role of our government is to create a conducive environment to increase the competition in pricing. Mm -hmm. How do we work on affordability? The affordability, most of the operators, they will tell you it is related to the cost of extending the internet from the submarine from the submarine landing point to the last mile access and also we have a mid mile access uh -huh. when i said we need to look at the regulation agile regulation policy why i am saying this that's why we delay most of our investment is because what does it do for our policy maker to make an attractive policy in terms of frequency spectrum pricing, one. Two, to say, okay, I have an area of the next three to five years, I would like to get from the coverage of 60% to 90%. I am giving a first right of refusal for our operators to extend the connectivity in those areas under these con uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the condition tax exemption mechanism, spectrum pricing, two and three and so because exactly as a Pakistan representative of the minister said, there are some area which will never be lucrative in terms of profitability for operators. So what are we doing in terms of regulation? And instead of doing a regulation for development, <coughs> we have a rigid regulation, which is the regulation for collecting taxes. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think, uh, Madam SG, this is a hard talk and is pressing to the policymaker to consider and set fit for purpose legal and regulatory framework that will accelerate the adoption and affordability of internet access. Uh, now, maybe before we proceed, I go to Dr. Rosa. As you mentioned that internet is a uh, human rights and you know that one of the challenge that has been uh, discussed or that we see is there's different categories that need to be protected in the internet uh my question to you is what category of the population seems to continue to lag behind in broadband adoption even when it is available uh to some they mentioned that people with disabilities girls and women uh what can be done to make sure that this group also is not left behind. Thank you very much for this question. And it is a very important question. I think the older generations are some of the uh, statistically and according to research that are still left behind. And, um, and I would like to say the adoption of you firstly i would like to say the adoption of human rights approach to access of information uh, by all countries cannot be over emphasized cannot be em emphasized enough and therefore i feel that is the access to to all is important but still the elderly and older groups 
are left behind. And I think we really need to work on that to bring them in the sphere of information because information and communication is important to all. Thank you. Uh, for those who are following us, we'll, you can ask the, this is a hard talk, and if you have a question, you can put it on the chat, and our speakers will directly address it. I will put it on them, and they will address. So if you have anything that you want to ask the speaker, you can write it on the chat. Thank you. Uh, I go back to uh, Anwar from uh, Pakistan. You mentioned about digital readiness or literacy, and you say it plays an important role in adoption rates. Digital readiness, which is the skills and abilities to use hardware and software uh, to communicate, manage information, navigate the internet, and identify threats and safety. These are key issues in, to the access and increasing this uh, connectivity. So my question is, digital skills that enable users uh, to take advantage of the connectivity and to effectively work in an increasingly digital economy. What is your views regarding skills development that enables and drive such adoption? And what is, you can give us a practical experience of Pakistan, which is well known in handling these issues. Welcome. Thank you very much. So um, I would say you're putting me on the spot. So, um... You know, it's a really hard discussion. <laughs> to, is it a hard talk? Uh, so, so, yes, it is a hard talk. So, but really good question. So first you asked me like, how we are utilizing our connectivity, but now how we are using our digital skills uh, to make sure that there's an outcome, right? That's what you yes. want to understand, that skills That's are exactly. not for the sake of skills. Degrees are not like a paper we hand over to someone that you got a degree. And yet there should be a utilization because there should be an outcome. There should be a growth uh, in, in people's lives. So that is exactly what we have thought through. So what the government has done, we set up uh, a, another um, a department, or you can say uh, a research fund, and uh, there was a startup fund, and the organization is called Ignite. So what we thought uh, that under the Ignite, uh, we set up incubation centers in the country. And we are providing um, startup mentorship, and we are providing, um, uh, you know, some some skills like the the real uh, life experience because theoretical skills uh, they can learn uh, through the digital digital digi skills program, and you know there there are other programs we run from time to time for uh, upskilling and literacy for the youth. But what they need to translate that skill into something tangible, monetize it. And that's why the incubation centers are the best placed um, you know, centers where we can incubate our startups. <clears throat> and we are growing that, um, you know, the incubation centers network. So we had initially five incubation centers. Uh, they were in the main cities, they were in the capital of the country, so Islamabad. And then they were in the main cities uh, of every state or every province. Uh, so one in Quetta, one uh, which is the uh, capital city of Balochistan, then one in Karachi, one incubation center there. Uh, Karachi is the um, the, the uh, main city or, or the capital city of the province Sin. Then we have one in Peshawar, uh, the incubation center, um, and Peshawar is the capital city of uh, the province called KPK. And uh, okay. similarly in Punjab. Thank you. Um, the the yeah. effort so, is, really, is really appealing. In the interest of time, you're really sharing the most important thing that's the incubation. There are some questions in the room. And Mr. Caleb, uh, could you please allow the, invite some to ask the question so that the, 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 the speakers can address Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, it's a very um, rewarding question that you've um, uh, sorry, rewarding um, moderation that you've you've done um, and with engaging questions. So we have Daniel Nangaka, um, who is our first um, um, the first intervention from the room. So um, Daniel, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, looking at uh, we are going hard this time um, as private sector or private uh, institutions. 
it's very difficult to be able to drive investment to a location whereby my return on investment is going to be low. So to be able to set up this infrastructure, I need to come up with uh, how I'm going to be able to be able to be able to mitigate the operational expenses of setting up this infrastructure. Let's look at power bills. Let's look at communication expenses, which even strains down to the capacity of uh, the l people in lo local to be able to consume this uh, technology. So if we say that the government is going to focus on uh, creating regulatory policies, but these regulatory policies do not uh, uh, impact the, the drive for investment in a specific region, then I think there is need to kind of revisit these strategies. So if you speak about regulation, and then you speak about investment in this critical infrastructure of connectivity, then let's find ways of how to be able to bridge the gap. Who offsets the operational expenses? That is some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And actually, Mr. Cohn was pushing that we need agile, fit for purpose regulatory framework. If there's any question in the floor, because of in the interest of time, we would like to hear also some questions from the room. We have like a few yeah. minutes, two or three minutes only. Okay. Um, do we have any questions um, from the room? Anyone interested in making any intervention or asking questions? Um, so it looks like we don't have any except this one from Daniel Nangeka. So um, over to you, Emmanuel, to coordinate and then wrap up the session. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the contribution that was given in the hard talk. Time is always limited. We have five minutes. And I would like to invite again <coughs> our coordinator and our SG who arranged everything and it made this to be a reality to give her closing remark on this because we have only five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Provocateur, for an excellent job. And coming out of the discussions and your probing questions, I could just, I've just listed, I'm just going to read them off. As the political will, importance, the importance of planning and setting targets, right? The, the, the need for the commitment of the budgets, um, making effective use of the Universal Service Fund is absolutely important for expanding the coverage. Uh, the, 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 then we, sp we spoke about, Pakistan spoke about the issue of local content, Sometimes, liter yeah. literacy programs for targeting the groups, incubation centers for startups, and expanding that network. Um, Dr. Pesent spoke about the new a new generation of human rights that recognizes there is a life in cyberspace and that mm -hmm. seniors should not be left behind. Yeah. Uh, Kone spoke about the need for uh, liberalizing the power you cannot have the ICT without, uh, without the power. Very important point. And the other point is the need for agile regulations and reg a new regulatory philosophy that encourages um, investment and competition. And these are things that would bring down the prices, not just for connectivity, but even mm -hmm. devices. So this has been a very rich, educational session and i want to thank our guests um the from pakistan mr A A A anwar from uh smart africa mr kone from namibia uh dr percent and of course our provocateur uh dr manessa this has been a very helpful session we will be crystallizing the, the things that we understand has have to be done to advance our whole agenda for ensuring that all people are connected and that their human rights are safeguarded. These are things that are very important, not just to the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, but to our panelists and the countries of the Commonwealth and beyond. And we will be continuing our discussion with the panelists because there was so much information that we could make use of. 
and we will be issuing a report. So I thank you all. I thank my panelists. I thank the provocateur. And I thank the audience, those who joined us this morning and stayed the course with us and asked questions that have us thinking and, and also for the, the rich discussion. It has been a great morning and I thank you all for your participation. I don't know if I there are a couple more minutes. Any, any closing remarks? I think we have two more, maybe two minutes before we are um, terminated. Any closing remarks from our panelists? Uh, <coughs> yes, I see. Uh, go Stan ahead, please. A hand. <laughs> yes, go ahead, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, program uh, and the hard talk. Really good questions, uh, provocative questions, but really good questions, putting us on the spot and uh, presenting uh, what we are doing in, in our country. I would uh, recommend, really, we should uh, continue this on a regular basis because that uh, not only shows the commitment uh, from the CTO as an organization, the Commonwealth Telecom Organization, which uh, Secretary General Excellency, you are heading it, that shows the commitment that you want to have the insights of what the countries are working on, but also that will give you some tools and some food for thought, how you can help these countries. And the countries who have done something great, you can use their lessons and their experiences to help the other countries so they can talk to each other and assist each other. Uh, I would say in Pakistan, something I mentioned even before, one, uh, um, I would say, um, the thing which I usually promote in uh, our meetings with uh, big investors, uh, whether they're in Saudi Arabia or China or United States and other countries, uh, what we have in Pakistan is a great skill, the fifth largest populated country of the world and we have a lot of skills, uh, IT professionals, they speak good English and uh, they can develop uh, good applications. So we have manpower. Our uh, median age in this country is uh, under 30 years. Uh, and uh, for, for population over 220 million, uh, we can support the world. However, on the finance side, there are countries who have finances. There are countries like rich countries. Uh, they can invest in Pakistan, they can utilize our manpower and they can build the uh, innovation centers, uh, the software development centers, gaming centers. So we, we are open to business for all the world and for Commonwealth countries. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Lucina and then Dr. Rosa, quickly, please. I think we, we are just... A very the... limited time, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Well, the, yeah, I don't the thing I have to say to you, I would like to thank really the Commonwealth Communication Organization under your leadership. Madam uh, Secretary General, and also thank uh, the, the the provocateur, <laughs> let's say Maya Mansa. I wish I had more time uh, to to deep dive to see you know why why do, I do believe that you know we need to be moving into agile policy regulation instead of just uh, which is a regulation for development instead of just a regular regulation regulation conventional regulation since back in 60s or 70s. Because if you see where Pakistan came from to where they are today, it has to do with the policy, agile policy regulation adaptation. Because sustainability on the long run, it depends on the innovation. And the innovation can only contribute to our social economic development if there is an adaptive regulatory environment. The yes. innovation is never rigid. And Thanks. this is just my last word. And thank you very much. And thanks to the organizer for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Rosa. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. And this was very, very enlightening with everything that came out. I just want to say in terms of human rights, uh, the inform information is always a risk, any information, but it's all about protection, protection of human rights. And thank you for this opportunity. Great. Thank you very much. And that, with that, we end our session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.